All right, I have six o'clock, uh, and so I will go ahead and get us started. I walked too far away from the live stream. We're live, so don't say anything you shouldn't be saying, all right? <laughs> no, it's so good to see y'all. Thank you for coming out tonight. We are about to start the week two of our Joshua class, um, and I will go ahead and get us started with a word of prayer. Pray with me. Holy and loving God, God who has gone before us and who commands angel armies on our behalf, we are so grateful for you. We are grateful that you are a God who loves us, who loves us enough to give you the word that we have before us today. We ask that you speak to us through the scriptures that we are about to read. Open our eyes so that we might see what you would have us see. Open our ears so that we might hear what you would have us hear. And open our hearts so that we may be changed by all of it. We pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Last week, as a quick recap to what we talked about, we started to talk about Joshua as the person who is, in a lot of ways, the young upstart. Moses has died. He was the leader of Israel, the one that Israel trusted, sort of, to lead them through the land of the desert. They had come to trust Moses. He was their leader for 40 years, and now he is gone. Joshua steps into the shoes to fill them. Now, what I will say about Joshua, and I didn't really cover that this last week, is Joshua is not necessarily young. Joshua was leading in battles 40 years prior. One of our first vignettes of Joshua is... Um, him fighting a battle pretty shortly after the Israelites go into the desert. So Joshua is not necessarily young, but he isn't nearly as old as 120-year-old Moses. And he doesn't have the same sort of clout that Moses had. He has to earn the trust of the people of Israel. And God, as we talked about, recognizes that this is going to be a very very hard thing to do. And so God tells Joshua the same thing many times. Does anyone remember? Be strong and courageous. There is a recognition right at the top of the book of Joshua that what Joshua is about to do is a new and hard thing. This is difficult work. He's going to be taking the people of Israel out of the land that they had become comfortable with. Not that the desert was great, but they spent 40 years there. Even the most not great places become home after 40 years. At least you know it. <laughs> and he's going to take them into this new land. And as far as they can tell, there are giants over there. And they have to take them out before they can have the land. It's tough work. So he gets that affirmation over and over and over again, be strong and courageous. As difficult as what comes next is going to be, be strong and courageous. The people of Israel, they say, yeah, sure, we'll follow you. We will follow you and follow you just like we followed Moses, like they followed Moses particularly well. Um, they did it. But they at least voice that they're interested in following him. And we're going to get to a point in our scripture today where there's a moment where Joshua is really 
named in a lot of ways the rightful leader. He had given, been given the title of leader of Israel, the person who was going to lead them into this promised land. But he doesn't earn it until a part of our scripture reading today. And we'll talk a little bit about that. After last week, does anybody have any questions about the first chapter of Joshua or the overview? Did anything come to mind throughout the week that you felt like was a burning question that you needed answered? All right. I can't tell if Dale has a burning question or that's just what his face looks like. <laughs> I'm just messing with you, Dale. <laughs> All right, so we're going to hop right in then, and we're going to start with Joshua chapter 2. Um, this is one of my favorite sections of scripture. I just think this is such a neat story, and we're going to learn a lot, too, about, I think, God's character through this story, even though it's just about this woman named Rahab. Can somebody read for me, and you can go ahead and read out loud, um, as always, the first uh, person to get to it wins the prize of reading it out loud. Uh, two, one through, <clears throat> let's do one through 14. I know it's a long one, but you can do it. I believe in you. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over at the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I do not know where they uh, had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly, you may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the ford to the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had run out, the gate was shut. But, but before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sinai and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you, for the Lord your God has gotten heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the life of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will show, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, and I'm sure if you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope. Oh, that's good. That's good. Thank you. I appreciate it. That was a long one. So I, I appreciate you reading it. I love this passage. It tells us a lot about the state of mind of the people of Jericho in the moment. There is a not particularly good movie on Netflix. You can watch it. This is not a, a movie that I can recommend from the pulpit. But it was a comedy movie that came out a few years ago called Don't Look Up. I don't know if you heard about it, but the entire premise of this movie is there is a massive, massive asteroid coming. It is coming to hit Earth, and it is going to destroy Earth. If you ever watched the movie Armageddon from the early 2000s, 
very similar premise. But instead of training these miners to go and plant nuclear bombs on this asteroid to blow it up so that it doesn't destroy the Earth, the people in power decide, nah, it can't be real. Something else is going to save it, or it's going to cost us too much money, and there's this small chance it won't hit us anyway. And so there's this whole sequence of people telling everyone else, you can see the asteroid in the sky, don't even bother looking up. Uh, I tell you about that because I think it reminds me a little bit of what was happening here in Jericho. Over the course of 40 years, 40 years, the people in the land of Canaan had heard about this nation, this group of people who have been moving through the desert guided by pillars of smoke and flame, whose God was so powerful that that God parted an entire sea and the people walked along dry seabed. And there were rumors, rumors that those people were coming. They were going to show up. Now, Jericho was relatively well defended. It was something that people had, <clears throat> people knew was hard to penetrate. They had walls that were incredibly tall. We learn about those walls. And if you were in Sunday school, I'm sure you heard the stories of the armies of God marching around Jericho. We get to read that today, too. It's a lot of fun. Oh, no, not yet. We read that next week. Sorry, everybody. Got everyone's hopes up. <laughs> But you hear about these walls, and yet the people on the ground, they're being told, don't worry about it. We're, we're good. It can't affect us. And the only person who knows what's to come is Rahab. We've heard the stories. I believe them. Spare us. Rahab is not a particularly morally upstanding character, at least is not portrayed to be up front. She is portrayed as a prostitute. Specifically, she would have been a prostitute to a god of another temple. Typically in this time, though there was prostitution just for income purposes in the ancient world, most often when the Old Testament is referring to prostitution, and sometimes even the New Testament. It's good. Do you need me to answer? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Most of the time when the Bible is referring to prostitution, they're talking about temple prostitution. Prostitutes who would live in the temple and they would use their profession as a way for people to come in and to worship whatever god that temple was for. These were typically gods of fertility or gods of love, whatever it might be. That, that's what their profession was. And so in a lot of ways, it was somewhat more noble because it was in, in worship to a god, but still not very highly viewed by the writers. And so Rahab is not portrayed as this particularly morally upstanding woman. But she's the one who recognizes, who sees that God is coming. And so these two spies who have been sent out into this land to try to figure out what in the world is going on with this city called Jericho that we can't see because it's on the other side of the Jordan to try to get some sort of planning going so they're not going completely blind, those two spies end up in Rahab's house, hidden from the king. The king knows that there are some spies. He's heard the rumblings himself. And instead of using this time again to address the problem, which is the fact that there is a nation that is going to come, this warring nation that has a God that can part seas, bring those spies to me. Don't say anything. Rahab hides the spies on the roof. 
and then begs for mercy because she knows what's going to come. God has this tendency throughout Scripture to pick the least likely people over and over again. This is not the hero of the story that you hear. This is not the one who is cast in the limelight in any other case. And yet God constantly, constantly chooses the underdog. God constantly chooses the person who no one else is going to look at for saving to be the one who is the most in line with who God is. And in this case, is the one who allows for the people of Israel to successfully enter into the promised land in the first place. Because without those spies coming back, Joshua would have been going in blind. This isn't the first time it happens, and it surely isn't the last. If you look back to the book of Genesis, Jacob is chosen as the brother who is going to be the one who continues the line, who is the recipient of the promises of God. Jacob was a jerk. <laughs> he was. That's the nicest way I could put it. He was a trickster. He was mean. He swindled his brother and his father-in-law. He lied and he cheated and he stole to get his way time and time again. And God still is the one who calls him Israel, the namesake of these people. Moses wasn't a particularly highly sought after figure either. Moses, he was the one who abandoned the people of Israel, not by his own fault, but he lived high in the palace. Things were going great for him. He had some anger issues. He murdered a guard. He smashes the first copy of the law. He had some anger issues and God chooses him. We get to Rahab, but going forward, even looking at Jesus, think about the people that Jesus chose to be his disciples, the 12. Tax collectors reviled. Fishermen smelled really bad. <laughs> even Judas, who received communion and who was given that grace. God was constantly constantly choosing the most unlikely. And this is just one rung in that story of God picking the underdog. There are a lot of things to be said about Rahab, but I love that the Christian tradition includes her. It's actually relatively unique. Uh, Judaism obviously talks about Rahab, though less often, um, because if we remember from last week and from some previous classes, if you were here, uh, Judaism is very Torah-centric, the first five books of scripture. The Torah to, this isn't a perfect analogy, by the way, um, but it's the best I can give you. The Torah to the Jewish people are like the gospels to us Christians. All of scripture is important. Everything that we have is important, but the gospels are what we really hold on to. Those stories are the most important to us because they tell us about Jesus. To the Jewish people, the Torah is the most important and Joshua is the first book outside of the Torah. You're really looking at those first five books. You're really looking at Moses. And so Ju the Jewish tradition, while yes, they use Joshua, they don't talk about Joshua quite as much. And when you look into other post-Jewish traditions like Islam, Rahab isn't even named because there's only one named woman in the entirety of the Quran. Does anyone know who it is? This is just a pop quiz. Mary, mother of Jesus, the only named woman in all of the Quran. Rahab's not included. We keep a tradition of God picking the underdog and it goes all throughout the Bible from the very beginning to the very end. God is always, always picking the least likely person. And I appreciate that about God. I think it's one of my favorite things about scripture. We get these stories over and over again that we'll look at people and say, no, surely God can't work through that person. And God says, oh no, oh no, I can and I will, and I'm going to. 
Um, that is that is exciting, and it's good news because there are days where I feel like oh, surely God can't work through me, and yet God still works. I'm going to go ahead and keep reading for us, uh, starting with verse 15. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the outer side of the city and of the city wall, and she resided within the wall itself. She said to them, go toward the hill country so that the pursuers may not come upon you. Hide yourself there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward, you may go your way. The man said to her, uh-oh, there goes the lights. Give me a second. There we go. Sorry. Sometimes our lights go up when we turn them on from over there. I will keep reading. The man said, to her, we will be released from this oath that you have made us swear to you if we invade the, the land and you do not tie this crimson cord in the window through which you let us down and you do not gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers and all your family. If any of you go out the doors of your house into the street, they shall be responsible for their own death and we shall be innocent. But if a hand is laid upon any who are with you in the house, we shall bear the responsibility for their death. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be released from this oath that you have made us swear to you. She said, according to your words, so be it. She sent them away and they departed. Then she tied the crimson cord in the window. They departed and went into the hill country and stayed there three days until the pursuers returned. The pursuers had searched all along the way and found nothing. Then the two men, <clears throat> then the two men came down from the hill country. They crossed over, came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him all that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, truly, the Lord has given all the land into our hands. Moreover, all the inhabitants of the land melt in fear before us. So there's, a lot going on in this one chapter. You have the Israelite spies going into Jericho, hiding in Rahab's house. Rahab making them swear that her family will be protected. Them agreeing to it and giving her the sign. Then them hiding and bringing back the news of what they had learned. Namely, bringing back this affirmation. They're afraid. They are afraid. They're not preparing. They're scared. Two things that I want to note. One, we get a glimpse of the gospel here. We get a glimpse of this idea that calling upon God is enough. Calling upon God's mercy is enough. Because we have one person in the entire town calling upon God's mercy, and she is spared. She knows that God is powerful and that God will come into the town. And we're going to talk a little bit more throughout this uh, book, and we talked about it last week as well, that in a lot of cases, these ancient war stories that we see are God at the forefront acting as the general um, that that is sort of central to, to what's going on. So she knows that God has the power to send the Israelites into this town and burn it down. And she calls upon mercy. And it's granted. There's not even a question. Just keep your family in your house and tie this cord so I can let everyone know what the sign is. And we will keep you safe. And they keep their word. We haven't gotten there yet, but they keep their word. Rahab's family is indeed saved. The second piece of it is that red cord. It's this little detail. Here is this little symbol, a string maybe. It can't be too big, right? Because here you have a paranoid king and a scared people, 
And all of the sudden, that house that you went to, because you heard the spies were there, but she said, no, 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 Rahab said they weren't here. They, they, I mean, they were here, but I, I sent them on their way. I don't know where they went. Now has a red cord tied in the window, and it's the only house that has that. I mean, we're probably talking about something pretty small. But the symbolism is important. And there's a parallel happening here. Can anyone pick up on what the parallel is? It's the Passover. A sign on the door. A red cord in the window. There is this parallelism that's being brought. What God did to Egypt, God can do again and God has offered mercy through this sign of this red cord in the window. God has invited in the sinner again. This parallelism is incredibly important. It, it really is. It is important for a few reasons. One, because it is this sign of mercy that we have the opportunity to see. And that in and of itself is worthwhile. But again, we are now outside of the Torah. We are now looking at a new leader. We have to have some way to see Joshua and the people of Israel as the same people of Israel from the book of Exodus. That was founded by Abraham. That got its namesake through Jacob. That same people are the people here. And we're going to talk a little bit more as we go about why it's so important that these people are the same people, the same promises, the same God, all of it. But that parallelism lets us start to see just how similar these stories are. Does anybody have any questions about Joshua chapter 2, about Rahab and the spies and all of that. Make a pretty good episode of TV. <laughs> I mean, it's a good story. All right. We're going to hop down then to, uh, <clears throat> we're going to hop down to chapter 3. And I love chapter 3. It's very good. Um, but I need for someone to read for me. Uh, we're going to read verse 12 through verse 17. It's kind of in the middle of a chapter. Seventeen, the end of the chapter. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carry the ark reach the Jordan and their feet touch the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarephan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the arks of the covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Thank you. I appreciate you reading that. This story is very important. Again, because it offers us some parallelism. Remember, we just had Rahab, who was in a city 
that is about to be destroyed, that is about to be visited by the wrath of God, who is saved by a sign on the window as opposed to on the doorpost. And now we have the people of Israel crossing a river that splits. You can tell that the author is really trying to call your mind back to that story. But something interesting happens. There's a difference between this story and Moses leading the Israelites across the Red Sea. And I think a lot of it has to do with maturity. I think, in fact, all of it has to do with maturity. The people of Israel in the book of Exodus were a very, very nascent people. And I don't say that because they were young. They'd been around for a very long time. But in terms of their maturity, they had not actually done the work of worshiping God. Not in any meaningful way, at least. They had been stuck in slavery. They had been driven into the ground. They had been suppressed. They could not worship the way that they wanted to worship For hundreds upon hundreds of years, they were stuck. And so, of course, when they come out of that land, they're immature. (laughs) They're being introduced to what will be this new to them in a lot of ways, faith. And on top of it, hey, guys, there are a lot of rules. (laughs) There are a lot of things that they have to do and things that they shouldn't do. It's all the stuff that we skipped when I jumped to Joshua instead of doing Leviticus numbers and Deuteronomy. It's a lot of rules. It's a lot that they have to learn to do together. And so when they first enter into that promise, or not the promised land, I apologize, the desert, their very first complaint is, did you bring us out here to starve? (laughs) At least we had full bellies back in Egypt. They didn't want to do the hard thing. Why do you think maybe, just maybe, Israel would have rather stayed in the desert? Yeah, their life was hard in the desert. It was hard in Egypt, but at least they knew what they were in for in the desert. They walked around. They followed the Ark of the Covenant. They went where God told them to go. And every day manna fell from the heavens and we had unlimited water from a rock. At least we knew what we had. And now you want us to go into this new land? And so here is this people, 40 years refined by the desert, by the law, by following Moses as best they can. And they are faced with another body of water that they have to cross. And something is different. When they cross the Red Sea, The army of Egypt was at their back. They were probably an hour from perishing. Those Egyptians would have charged them and killed everybody. And Moses raises his staff in a mighty act of defiance of Pharaoh. And they cross the Red Sea. And they run as fast as they can to get to the other side. There's no Moses with a staff. In this story. In just a few words, we learn that the people of Israel have learned. You might have caught it. The water didn't part until their feet touched it. The water didn't part until they stuck their foot into the water. What a lesson. (laughs) I mean, really, what an incredible lesson lesson. God opened the door for them before. God did all of the work. And this time God says, you got to trust me. Nothing's moving until you take that first step. And guess what? Your foot's going to touch the water. And I think we can learn something from that. I think in our own lives, we often find ourselves trying our best to say, all right, God, waiting for you to open the door. And God's just wondering, have you tried the knob? (laughs) have you have you you're waiting for me to there's a knob right there have you looked have you checked it 
Here is a more mature nation of Israel, not perfect, but mature, who have now learned to trust in the provision of God and they don't complain. They, God said, I will part the Jordan and you will walk across it just like you walked across the Red Sea. And those priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant said, okay, let, we are in. And they put their feet in the water. Sometimes God's waiting on us. God's waiting on us to act. Sometimes we got to get our feet a little wet before God parts the rivers in front of us. It's an incredibly powerful story. Again, it shows us just how much these people have grown. They have gone from a scared people carrying as many jewels and gold as they can out of the land of Egypt with an army at their back to being an army themselves crossing rivers through God's power and trusting it's going to happen. There's a lot there, but it's a good story. And it keeps the parallel going. It's the same people. Again, more refined. I'm going to start reading in chapter 4. <clears throat> then, or sorry, when the entire nation had finished crossing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, select 12 men from the people, one from each tribe, and commanded them, take 12 stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood. Carry them over with you and lay them down in the place where you camp tonight. Then Joshua summoned the 12 men whom he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe. Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of Israel, so that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off in front of the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the Israelites a memorial forever. The Israelites did as Joshua commanded. They took up 12 stones out of the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua, carried them over with them to the place where they camped and laid them down there. Josh set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. The priests who bore the Ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything was finished, that the Lord had commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people crossed over in haste. As soon as all the people had finished crossing over the river, the Ark and the Lord the ark of the Lord, and the priest crossed over to the front of the people. The Reubenites, the Gadites, the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over armed before the Israelites and Moses had ordered them. Before the Israelites, as Moses had ordered them. About 40,000 armed men, about 40,000 armed for war, crossed over before the Lord of the plains of Jericho for the battle. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of Israel, and they stood in awe of him as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. So Joshua has been given this leadership position. You are the commander of the Israelites, of this army of 40,000 people. This is no small force. <laughs> this is a large group of people. You are the commander of these people. And now they see that God is the one leading them there because God has parted the Jordan. And so they set up a memorial, a lot like Jacob did. It's not exactly the same, but it's this place of remembrance. If you remember in the book of Jacob, or in the story of Jacob, not the book of Jacob, there is no book of Jacob. Um, in the story of Jacob, Jacob has this vision in his dream that we often refer to as Jacob's ladder, this place where these angels are ascending and descending from heaven, going up and down this massive ladder, and God is present, and Jacob wakes up, and he sets up this stone remembrance of this vision. 
Here, Joshua is doing the same thing. He is setting up this set of 12 stones, kind of arranged in a circle, to memorialize this moment. And telling the priests, when your children come to you, after all of this is said and done, after this land is ours, tell them what happened here. Tell them what God did. This is the first thing that has been set up in this land that is the Israelites since Abraham's wife was buried there. It is the first stone the Israelites have set onto the land since the headstone of Sarah. And the Israelites recognize this because Joshua had been named their leader, yes, but it's not until this moment where Joshua says, when your children come to you, tell them what God did, that the Israelites really believe that Joshua is their leader. It took some trust building. It's not easy work. It, it takes time to build up that level of trust. And it took time for Joshua. It took all the way until this moment. But the trust was finally built. We often, <clears throat> excuse me, we often see Joshua as this commanding presence. Or at least when I think about Joshua, that's what I think. He is the commander of an army of 40,000 Israelites that goes and invades a land that he's only sent two people in to see and wins. <laughs> I mean, Joshua is a pretty impressive guy. But in this moment, he passes on being impressive. And he says, remember what God did. It's a humility that earns him respect. And humility is important. Never pray for humility. Um, when you pray for humility, you get it. <laughs> um, but you can show humility. And often, humility is what is necessary for people to trust us as Christians generally. Being humble, saying, look at what God did. Not, hey, I got this really nice car. You want to go see it? No, look at what God did in my life. To allow me to do this. Look what God allowed me to build in my family. Look what God allowed me to do here today. Look at what God did. And it's at that moment that Joshua earns trust. It's at that moment where Joshua goes from being the appointed leader of the Israelites to being the leader of the Israelites because he's earned trust. It took time. But this is the moment. This is where that trust is earned. Does anybody have any questions about the crossing of the river um, and that moment? Uh, anything that we've talked about since our section on Rahab, about God, about the Exodus and how it relates? Anything that comes to mind? When they crossed over the Jordan, mm -hmm. is that like everybody, women and children, do? No. So uh, we talked about this last week uh, a little bit, but not everybody is crossing the river. Um, specifically, God tells Joshua to leave most people behind in the desert. Um, most of Israel is in the desert. Um, and at this point, most of Israel, I mean, we're talking, this is probably about 10%. I, I'm making a guess here. We don't have an official number from the Bible of how many people. When the people of Israel entered into the desert, there were 300,000 of them. That's what we know. 300,000 men. Um, so probably more than that. We can guess here about 40 years later, we're looking at 400 to 450,000. I mean, that's, that's a guess. I mean, I can't know for sure, but that's what I would guess based off of, you know, I've seen uh, the Earth's population in my own lifetime hit 7 billion and then 8 billion. And so I, I'm taking some guesses here, maybe some liberties, but there's also a harsh place for them to live. And so families probably didn't grow as quickly. So this is just the army. It is just the fighting men specifically. Um, everybody else has remained 
on the other side of the door, maybe. Questions? Comments? Noticings? I'm kind of wondering why why they did have to leave the desert to go to the Netherlands. So this comes back to what we learn <clears throat> in the book of Genesis. So going all the way back um, to the very beginning and the call of Abraham and the promise that God makes. There is a sense that this is a fulfillment of that promise because what God promises to Abraham is two things. Do any of our Bible study veterans remember? Land and lineage. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> Land and lineage. You will have offspring that outnumber the, the stars and the dust on the earth, and you will go to a land of milk and honey, the land of Canaan specifically. This is the land that God has promised to the Israelites. And so the book of Joshua, in a lot of ways, serves as the book of fulfillment. The Torah is, those first five books are building up to this moment the crossing into that land, sending the force to go and raise most of it to the ground and claim it as their own. Um, and it's not that God had promised them a land of milk and honey. It was this land. We can talk a little bit about why that is. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of strange, but it's the mo most helpful way that I can, uh, that I can put it. It goes back to the, the Canaanites were always looked at uh, throughout all of Israel's history up till this point and even further. I mean, even today, it, the connotation for the word Canaanite is this kind of rough and rowdy and negative kind of con connotation. Um, it goes all the way back to the story of Noah, Noah and the Ark, um, specifically after Noah is, <clears throat> after Noah lands the Ark and According to the story, the only people left are Noah and his sons and now his grandchildren. Um, there is a moment in that story where Noah has gotten too drunk and is passed out in his tent and his sons see him naked and yeah, they laughed and they shamed him. And Noah puts a curse on that son's child that son's child was a Canaanite. That's, that's the origin of the Canaanite people, um, at least within the, the story. And so this has always been, or at least since early Genesis prior to chapter 12, a cursed people. And so it had to be this land, again, because it was, was promised to Abraham. That's why they're going off into this land what was promised to them. Um, Moses specifically isn't going off because he got angry again. Um, and that was his punishment. You don't get to see the promised land. Um, and so we'll hang out for until you die and then send somebody else in. Um, Moses never gets to see it. Joshua does though. Um, but yeah, that's why. Yes? I think it's kind of interesting that after fleeing uh, Egypt that it uh, took them so long to finally be the aggressor I mean, they, they knew where they were going, you know, where they wanted to go for a long, long, long time. It took a long, long, long time. Well, those 40 years was, was um, Moses' punishment. I mean, you're going to be... It, the 40 years not, wasn't specifically Moses' punishment. It was Israel's punishment for worshiping the golden calf. Um, for breaking the law. God punishes them to those 40 years. And so they might have tried. I mean, I am sure that there's a moment, a vignette, uh, I'm only imagining, of a group of Israelites saying, it's just over that river. We can swim there. Let's go. I mean, we, we're talking 40 years that are summed up into three books. No matter how long those books are, you're going to miss some stuff. I imagine that that happened at some point, and then they couldn't. They couldn't make it. Um, yeah. They, uh, or to give them well, yes. So there was also the sense that 
in Egypt. They probably picked up on some Egyptian re religion. But that speaks to, and this is kind of going back to the crossing the Jordan in the first place. Yes, that 40 years might have seemed like a harsh punishment. I'm going to be real. 40 years is a harsh punishment for anybody, right? Like when, we, when we're talking about even like when we're talking some of our harshest punishments in the U.S. outside of death, right? You're looking at 25 years in a lot of cases. Sometimes if you double up the sentence, you're looking at 50. But even 25 years, I mean, that is a life-altering amount of time. There are people who are going to die. Um, specifically, God says there is a generation that needs to die off before you get, before you get into the promised land, um, which seems harsh. <laughs> I mean, it really does. Um, but then we get to that moment 40 years later where the people of Israel are refined enough to step into the water before it parts. Um, God knew what God was doing. It wasn't, it, it, it seems like it would have been a punishment that, that would be harsh. And yet, would those people 40 years prior have put their foot in the water? Probably not. <laughs> Given everything that they had shown up to that point, probably not. Um, and so there's the refinement period, and that's what that 40 years is. All right. Because of time constraints, I'm going to jump down to chapter 5 real quick. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to, I'm going to skip down. Uh, we, we get a moment where there is a circumcision that takes place. I'll just mention that briefly. Um, there have been 40 years of people in the desert. And these are people who have been doing their best to try to practice Judaism. Um, but circumcision happens at a particular time in the life of a Jewish boy, typically around 12 or 13 is when it would have happened. When we think of circumcision today, we typically think of newborns right after they're born. I mean, not in Jewish tradition. 12 or 13 is when it would have happened. But here are these people who have been alive for 40 years. Um, some of them probably older than 40. If Moses is any indicator, he was 120 when he died. Um, and so there is a good likelihood that when they would have been circumcised, they were in Egypt. They hadn't been practicing their religion. And so God is saying, you've entered into this land that I promised you. I am up holding my end of the promise. And one of the most important parts of your end of the promise was this, this sign that I am your God, which is circumcision. That's why that takes place. Uh, I don't think there's a lot more that needs to be said about it. I think the better stuff is down starting in verse 10. Can somebody read verse 10 through the end of the chapter for me? The man stopped the day after. They ate the food from the land. There was no longer any mountain for the Israelites. But that year, they ate of the produce of the land. Keep going. Yeah, starting in 13. Yeah. No worries. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for this his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Okay. So. More parallels. Here we have the Passover being celebrated before the invasion of the city of Jericho. Um, again, saying to us, this is the same people. And then this guy shows up. <laughs> um, there are some Bibles that will have subtitles above it. And some people will say this is a vision. Um, I don't know. It never says it's a vision. Uh, and so I don't, I don't necessarily know if it's a vision or not. Scripture doesn't tell us, but it definitely could be interpreted that way. Either way, this dude shows up. No one knows who he is. And there are theories, right? I'm the commander of the armies of the Lord. And those theories depend upon how we read our scripture. 
And so I'm going to reteach for some of you or teach you for the first time what I taught in the Genesis class, which is when we read scripture, we have two different ways that we can read it, especially when we're reading the Old Testament. It is either with our forward-facing hat on or our backward-looking hat on. And both are important. They are. The backward-looking hat is the way to read scripture through the lens of those of us who know who Jesus is and know what Jesus did and believe in a triune God and are looking at this scripture through the lens of a Christian theology. That's one way that we can read scripture, and it's really helpful. And if you read scripture that way, then it's really easy to see that this is a pre-incarnate. So before Jesus came as a human being, Christ, the word, the commander of God's armies, the one who is the Lord of the universe. We could look at that and say, this is who that is. And that's a great way to read it. And if you read it that way and you hear it that way, then I, more power to you. I also think it's important for us to read scripture from the lens of the people who this scripture was originally written for. And for those people, they ain't ever heard a thing about Jesus. <laughs> Jesus wasn't even a thought to them. Their very for their first conception wasn't, oh, that's the Messiah. That's God. No. It's a guy who showed up. And so you could say maybe this is an angel or another person in the land of Canaan who is someone who is of God. It's the same question that's always asked that I think is, is a helpful one. Um, when you look at uh, Cain and Abel after Cain kills Abel and Cain is given by God a mark so that he'd be protected from the other people. And then you say, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. What other people? I thought it was Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. It's a, there's, there might be a similar thing going on. Is there already a commander of God's armies, just like Joshua is a commander of the army of Israel in the land of Canaan? Possibly. So there are a lot of different ways to read it. We don't have a, a necessarily singular way to read it. I think all of them are fine. But I think it's always important, and we'll end with this because it'll be the last thing. It's not the most exciting end, but it is a helpful one for us as we are people who read Scripture and try our best to understand Scripture. It is always good for us to remember how Scripture was read. It's not the only way that we read Scripture, right? If we only read Scripture the way that the people who heard Scripture read Scripture, then we would be missing out on a lot. <laughs> and if we only read scripture through a Christian lens, we miss out on a lot. We can do both. It, we can learn more from the text. Ancient, uh, or not ancient, sorry. Rabbis have named this phenomenon of reading scripture through different lenses and, and taking assumptions that we have about Christianity and putting them into the Old Testament text or possibly taking those assumptions out and reading it like that or asking different questions. They, they refer to scripture that way as a 70-sided jewel. Have you ever held a real jewel? I mean, it could have been a ruby or something like that. If you ever get a chance to, you can even see it with a prism. You don't have to have a jewel. Prisms will work just fine. Turn it and look at it in different ways. And as you turn it, you'll see all of these different images as new colors and shapes appear inside of the prism, inside of the jewel. The rabbis would refer to scripture as a 70-sided jewel to say, as you interrogate the text, as you do the work of trying to read the text as best as you can, you can learn more. And that doesn't mean that that first image that you saw wasn't there. <laughs> It just means that as you look at it from a different angle, you can learn more. It's part of the reason why Jesus spent so much time teaching in parables. Parables are stories that are in some ways puzzles. As we read them and as we wrestle with them and as we look at the characters and their interactions and ask what tone of voice did this character say that and how long was this person gone before they came back and was this person angry or happy or scared? we get different answers out of the text. 
Scripture is a living word, and we can talk to it like it's a living word and ask different questions, and it'll give us new and exciting information. So that's where we're going to end tonight uh, with, with that note. We'll be picking up next week in Joshua 6, um, a little bit shorter of a reading, 6 through 8. So chapter 6, 7, and 8 all the way through is what we'll be reading. Um, and we will read specifically about that fun Sunday school story when those walls came tumbling down. Um, so I'll be excited about that. Before we close, though, I do want to take some prayer requests. I know Beth had one. She had asked earlier. Um, so what prayer requests do we have? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my nephew, Ty, who lives in Dallas, is maybe has two weeks to live mm. cancer. His family is all with him. Yeah. So I'm just praying they get some time together. Yeah. Absolutely. Prayers for him that he also feels comfortable and ready and prayers for all of you as you mourn what is to come. Yes. I'm heard of um, the wife um, uh, is in the ICU from on a recent foreign program or whatever on a recent the husband went to visit her and had a heart attack. Mm. So I don't know when somebody called me and asked me to put them on our prayers. Absolutely. And I found out on the way coming here, uh, you might have heard me talk about Melissa, my cousin, who I talk all the time about. Her brother uh, was having trouble. He was falling asleep all the time and dropping things, couldn't hold on to things. And so they took him to the ER and did an MRI. And he's got, uh, I don't know how extensive it is, but he's got a brain bleed. Mm. And uh, they're questioning strokes and that sort of thing. So, oh. um, strength. strength for the family and knowledge for the doctors. Absolutely. Yeah. My niece, uh, Michelle Fox, had two successful uh, stents put in her heart yesterday. Wonderful. And as soon as the cardiologist feels comfortable, she will start the radiation for her breast needs. Absolutely. That's good news. We do, we do oh. need to have prayers for my neighbor, Mike and Neil. Mm -hmm. He has been diagnosed with potential right middle lobe lung cancer. Oh, okay. And uh, he's scheduled the first to next month to go down to Moffitt, and they're going to operate and do the biopsy at that time. And if it's positive, remove uh, the middle lobe of his right lung and uh, he's been through a lot he lost his wife just a little over a year ago and he also had previous other problems so it's, it's not, yeah he's feeling too great right now well let's go before our god in prayer oh the right word for the honor reason is ruptured yeah <laughs> To know what ruptured honors. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Still torn or you know, whatever. Yeah. But the aperture is ruptured. Honors. Well, let's pray, friends. Holy God, again, you command the armies of the angels and you command our lives. You love us so deeply and so dearly, and you've created all of creation just so that we might get to know you and you might get to know us so that we might have a relationship with you. And for that, we are so grateful. But this creation has been marked, torn by sin, and sin has led to sickness and death and pain and suffering. And Lord, in the midst of that sickness, in the midst of that death, in the midst of that suffering, oh God, we pray that you speak. 
Lord, where it is your will for all of the prayer requests lifted up today and all those that have gone unsaid, we pray that you offer healing, that you offer peace and grace, and that you bring us back to full health as our great physician. And Lord, where it is not your will for that to happen, we ask that you offer us peace, that you remind us that it is not an act of malice on your part to not heal, but instead an act of mercy for those who may be suffering the greatest. Lord, we ask that you comfort those around those who are sick, that you offer peace, that you offer joy, that you offer hope, even when it feels like there is none to go around. We pray these things because you are a God who does love us, who has come to us in the form of Jesus Christ, and who knows how to heal, who knows how to mourn, who knows how to walk alongside us in the midst of suffering. And we are incredibly grateful. We ask that you go with us from this place, O oh God, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Give us the strength and the protection that we need to come back to this place again so that we might worship you as fully as we possibly can. We pray all of these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, friends. It was so good to see you today.